Greetings, 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 everyone. Greetings. Uh, let's enter into this uh, session of 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 uh, podcasting, Spreaker podcasting. Welcome, I'm on all my 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 networks that I'm usually on. Let's enter into this with a little praise song, Sanctuary. Okay, and we'll sing that song, and then we'll enter in with some prayer. And we'll speak about uh, our topic. We'll we'll read some scripture. We'll go on an adventure in the Word, and uh, then we'll have our repentance prayer at the our repentance reading of, of the Psalm at the end, and encouragement to have our own personal repentance prayer with Jesus. Okay, now let me get warmed up here. Y'all can sing along with me. Simple song. Earphones on because you know, lo and behold, well, what happened was the earphones, the battery died out. You know, so my Bluetooth earphones that I'm using on my computer, uh, I don't have them in. But I made sure, I still made sure that I'm, I'm, I'm being heard on Spreaker. I don't want what happened the last time uh, to happen again. Let's see. Uh, I'm gonna. I, I had got a. a, a um, let me start by prayer. Let's let's go to, to uh, let's go to Matthew chapter six. Start with the Lord's prayer, and then we'll say a little bit of a of a prayer on on the end of that. And then uh, we'll, we'll get in. I'll get into the topic and the subject matter and of Oh Lord, prepare me to be that sanctuary. So I'm trying to remember you guys' time and be formal about it. While at the same time, looking forward for the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us on an adventure into the Scriptures. So, here we go. Um, Matthew chapter 6. I'm reading out of my complete Jewish Bible. Please read out of the Bible that you feel most comfortable with this Saturday morning. This Saturday uh, evening. Sorry, this Saturday. Well, it's 4 o'clock. It's coming into the evening. By 6 o'clock it'll be evening. Uh, it says here, starting in verse 9, You therefore pray like this, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. 
May your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the food we need today. Forgive us what we've done wrong, as we too have forgiven those who have wronged us. And do not lead us into hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one. For kingship, power, and glory are yours forever. Amen. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will not forgive yours. So now we're going to come in with some prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now in the sweet name of Jesus Christ, just thanking you. Thank you for allowing us this opportunity once again, allowing me this opportunity to to uh, be used by you, to get your word out, to preach and encourage those of us who, uh, whether we are consider ourselves Christians or not today, another opportunity to, to repent, turn away from wickedness and sin, and, and prepare ourselves, just as the, this particular sermon says, prepare ourselves to receive your anointing, to receive your blessing, and to be called and be used by you to do a great work. We pray and ask these things, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, there's a, a, a person named, he calls himself J.R. Panda. I'm trying to search for him. J.R. Panda. Uh, this person, J.R. Panda, I want to thank you. He was, uh, I'm going to uh, have to go onto my emails for a minute and, and search J.R. Panda. He was listening on YouTube and he was, uh, he referred a message uh, concerning uh, the, the, the sermon I spoke about, about the DACA immigrants. Let's see, J.R. Panda. I tried to um, do an email, uh, re, re, uh, reply to him through the YouTube, through, the, uh, through my email, and I wasn't able to do it. So that's why I have to look it up on, on, on mail. This is what he said, his comment. And, and I want to thank you, Mr. J.R. Panda. I don't know what state I had put in it. To try to reply, I would like to know what city and state or country uh, you were listening to, the, to this particular sermon. It's, it's a blessing that the Lord, the Lord God gave you, uh, put it on your heart to listen to this sermon. And it lets me know that there's someone else listening. Thank you. I thank all of you who are listening. I'm going to read some names a little later on. But I just wanted to, to show some of you out there. I, I told you before, the content that I preach about, the content... That uh, of repentance and of really bringing forth what the Bible is teaching us about the the Jesus Christ coming out of the Bible is not really uh, the the Jesus Christ that most people believe he is, and 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 that how it's important for us in these last days and these days of people where we got disaster after disaster happening. The fire now in California was uncontrollable for so long and killing a whole bunch of folk. And, and then all these earth, wind, and fire, natural disasters. And then we had the man coming up and shooting in the church one Sunday. And, hey, Danny Wilborn, we had the man coming up and shooting in the church one Sunday. And then the next Sunday after that, we got the man in Las Vegas just, just mowing people down with bullets and things of that nature. And, and, and of us not knowing, just not knowing when, when our time is going to be. Or if that... If that it's time for the, the, the Jesus, the Holy Master, to come before we even get taken up out of our flesh. If he's going to come back with the clouds, we don't know when that time is. And the, the, the um, last few sermons I did is, is really about preparedness. I've been teaching and preaching about preparedness. But what I want to thank J.R. Panda about, he, he sent me a message about the DACA, uh, the DACA sermon that I did. Now, I want to let some of y'all know that... Uh, Spreaker only gives me a certain amount of space to hold, about a hundred hours of, of, of sermons to hold for people to listen to or go back to or to archive. So as we're going forward, some of my older messages, some of my older sermons, are, are get, I'm deleting them so that I have space to hold the new ones. So I, I wanted to let y'all know that, you know, that's honestly, that's all I can, can afford right now. Um... Remember, this is a for-profit ministry. It's going out in the for-profit 
profit manner, not a non-profit, simply because uh, this was the platform that the Lord told me to do, being that the message that I, that, that I am to preach is directly from the Bible. And um, there's a lot of people out there that, that, that really can't handle this message. And, and I thank you. If, if I thank the Lord and I thank you if you, you've hung on. You know, um, some people have already, you know, near and dear to my heart have already told me they can't handle the message anymore. And why don't I speak about all the good things of God and, you know, the, the things that they're used to hearing. You know, and I'm still coming back and telling you, if a person loves you, they're going to tell you the truth. And I love all of you. The way God told me to love you. I love all of you and I love myself. I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't want nobody myself or nobody else that I preach to on the day of judgment saying, nobody ever told me this, this, that, and the other. Nobody ever called me to repent from these things. And, and here I was. I thought I was, I was on my way to heaven. I was lifting you up in church, Lord. And I was praising the name of Jesus Christ, lifting Jesus Christ up and everything like that. But here I am, unable to enter the kingdom of heaven because nobody ever pointed out to me or... Maybe they just didn't make it plain or, or, or were not stern with me about the things that I need to repent from. The things that, that the reason why Christ came in the first place. Even though Christ nailed, nailed all sin on the cross, that does not give me a green light to stay in my sin or in my sinful nature. And, I, and as the book of Revelation says, there's a lot of people who will not, who will not, Accept that as as uh, the truth because they've grown up in uh, in some Christian societies like Mormons and, and people like that who are um, who have or the order they have grown up in some cults. I, I was just looking on uh, on uh, Hulu. They have a series. Uh, Escape polygamy. I just I just watched it last night. I was just starting to watch it last night. Where these uh, there's this place called the Order up there in Utah, where these Mormon or it's a Mormon sect or something like that. These guys are marrying off. They're like a, a lions, a herd of lions. They're marrying off to their own relatives and stuff like that to their own to these little teenage girls in the name of Jesus Christ, which is a lie, and. Uh, Teaching these children from birth that the women are supposed to be subject to this. Uh, if you're not part of the dominant male clique, you get thrown out and sent out into the to the rest of the world. Uh, and they say they condemned them to, to going to hell and all this kind of stuff. Uh, if y'all get the chance to look up look it up on Hulu, that that's one of the the lying one of the lying. Uh, Doctrines that are out there. Why it's so important. Why it's so important. So, there's children growing up being taught this stuff. There's children growing up being taught this stuff. And they're being taught that this is what Jesus Christ expected of them. You know, so that's why the Lord has me out here telling you the truth. It's not just Mormons. It's, you know, I, I talk about... Um, I don't want anybody to, to be ashamed of your culture or your racial background, but race, our racial, whatever our race is, if it's African, Native American, Asian, or Caucasian, and all that, that does not give you or me a, a, a free pass into heaven. Okay? That's the, that's the, the, the true matter. There's, there's doctrines out there where people have are even teaching their own children that this is what there's a lot of lying doctrines out there and that's why the Lord has me has me teaching this under this platform where I'm not controlled by you know this particular platform is not controlled by a non-denominant administration I'm not against non-denomination because your church is supposed to be non-denominant however just as I've been preaching, you know, a lot of a lot of churches, uh, they're mega churches. They they want to build more churches, and they and you know, and that's great. They want to get people out of poverty. That's great, but they have compromised the true message of Christ in order to do so. Now, I'm going. That's what we're going to be talking about. But before we do that, I want to address what 
Mr. J.R. Panda or Mrs. J.R. Panda, I don't know if male or female, uh, J.R. Panda says to me, you have a good point that maybe DACA recipients can mission in their native countries. If y'all remember, I was talking about if if y'all wind up over there uh, in your in your country because of Donald Trump and what he's talking about and sending everybody, the dreamers away, if you wind up there, take the time to, to, to lift up Jesus Christ and be used by him, no matter where you wind up in the future, because we don't know. So he says, uh, DACA recipients can mission in their native countries, but there is a huge flaw there. You know, some do not even know their native language. And I know some DACA Christians who can't even speak their native language. Thank you for your encouragement, though. That's what it was saying. You know, that's what, what kind of... Uh, and, and, and in my response to that, I wanted to... Uh, if I did not erase it already, I wanted to remind... Hey, Aubrey. I wanted to remind uh, you, uh, Mr. or Mrs. J.R. Panda, that during... That three hour long session, I do believe I did mention that that if the Lord does not want anyone to be sent back to their country by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, if he is not in agreement, in any kind of agreement, if it's not working to his major plan, y'all not going to leave anyway. No weapon formed against a Christian shall prosper, even a weapon... If you happen to be a DACA immigrant and uh, and they make this law and all that kind of stuff, be rest assured. Be very rest assured. It ain't You ain't going to leave the country if God don't want you to leave the country. But if you do wind up over there, is the Lord's arm too short to teach you? Not only by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, He will make sure that you have everything you need in that new country. To glorify his name? You know? Who gave man his mouth? I'm, I'm just asking you, J.I. Pan. I'm not, I'm not trying to insult you or anything like that. But remember, who gave man his mouth? That he should speak in the first place. What happened at the Tower of Babel? Who, who gave everybody their different language on the face of the earth? What happened at the, at the day of Pentecost? When the, when the, the um, apostles... Began speaking in tongues in unison. But who opened up the people's ears that although, and they saw the fire of tongues come down, although they knew these people were speaking in a tongue, they heard it. Who opened up the people's ears that they heard it in their own language, their own dialect, irregardless of where you came from? Do not, the Lord's arm is not too short. If Anybody from a DACA, if anybody would wind up going back to your native country and not knowing a thing, be rest assured the Lord will make a way for you to glorify His name. The Lord will make a way for you. You will be all right, no matter where you wind up. I ain't saying you're gonna be rich. Remember, you know the the Holy Bible does not necessarily say. I know there's a lot of pastors and preachers. Y'all preaching, uh, help get people out of poverty uh, by putting trust that Jesus is going to lift them up out of poverty. Hallelujah. Don't stop doing that, but we must include. We have to include the rest. We can't just focus on one thing and then just forget to talk about the other stuff. You know? And um, so that's what I wanted to, to mention to you, Mr. J. Mr. or Mrs. J.I. Panda. I didn't want to, I don't want you to feel like I'm. I'm attacking you or rebutting what you said or anything like that but in Jesus Christ there is no flaw if you wind up if you're Christian you're born again Christian no matter where you wind up that's where the Lord wants you and if he don't want you there be rest assured as long as you trust and obey him you ain't gonna be there anyway you know I did say also in that DACA message that I hope that the the, the people in this government you know, that they would wake up. They would turn away from their wicked ways and, and, and the Lord would open them up to see how valuable so many document immigrants are to the progress of this country. And if they do, if, and if they fail or refuse 
to see that they're gonna be throwing out the baby with the bathwater when if they want if if the leaders or all the people who are against DACA or Dreamers or DACA immigrants, if 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 y'all wind up throwing people out and then looking back later and saying, "Oops, we made a mistake." Those people were so intelligent. And now the United States is no longer the number one country or the most powerful country in the world because we've thrown out everybody that everybody that was once devoted to making this country great. We threw them out because we couldn't get along with the color of their skin or the language that they spoke or the content. You know, it wasn't the content of their character. It was the color of their skin that you couldn't get along with. You know, now if, if, if those of you who are leaders and you say you have control of the country... If you wind up doing that, that's your own fault. Now, I did mention that in those two things. But getting back to what we talk about here now. Uh, oh, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Now, but we, what else were we talking about? Uh, I have been going on about repentance. And repentance from what? You know, and I've, I've asked the Lord to try to show me the most loving way to do it. The most loving way. Um, my last my last podcast and video cast, when... Uh, when I read Romans chapter 1 and 2 I deliberately changed because Pastor Paul keeps saying they, they, they all the time I had deliberately changed at to we and us and I and the reason being is because like I said in the last one which I'm going to go I, I plan to go on in this time I'm going to go on to Romans chapter 3 now we can go now that the foundation is laid of repentance is laid now that I have, we have been talking about what we suppose, what kind of content of character, what kind of daily activities is a, a, a sin in God's eyes and an abomination in God's eyes, what kind of people are we without Jesus Christ? If, 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 if I did not have the anointing of the Holy Spirit in my life, what kind of person would I be? What kind of, what kind of daily activity would I be involving myself in? And so I changed Romans chapter 1. I changed that in a sense saying, um, I want all of you to think about, to think about um, your daily activities. Especially if you're calling yourself a Christian. And I want to remind you too, I don't have the best equipment. That's why I'm yelling or, or speaking kind of loud. I'm not yelling at anybody. And I know it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound the most emotional thing in the world, I guess that's my, my military background, you know, barking out orders, I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, to go through that again, and like what I just said, to remind y'all, if, if y'all could open up your Bibles and, and read uh, Romans chapter 1, between verse 16, up, up until uh, all the way to the 32, verse 32, and, and think about that. Think about it in that manner. If if I was not saved, and if I was still living a life of sin, this is the kind of person I would be as I read. But because, see, we have to, remember I've been saying before, we have to specify to the young children. This world is not specifying. This world, everything that, that the Holy Bible says is a sin or abomination to God Every just about every TV program you, you watch, every cartoon they watch, or every advertisement, everything in this world, just about everything in this world right now is encouraging these young children to do the opposite. And if we as Christians fail to talk about it because we're, we, we, you know, especially those of us are leaders in churches and everything like that, we don't, we, we even neglect, we don't even bring those subjects up because we're so worried, just like the Sanhedrin was worried. What was the Sanhedrin worried about? They was worried about not making enough money to pay their taxes. So when John the Baptist first came and was drawing people out in the desert, that was the first thing they said. We're losing money because of because of John the Baptist preaching. That's why they didn't like it. That's why when he came when they came out to him, he called them a brood, brood of vipers. It was about money, you know, and having to pay taxes to see to the Romans. Uh, if you didn't have the proper tax to the Romans, just like maybe taxes, 
taxes today in the United States. The Romans would shut you down. The Romans would, t- you know, destroy all of your your property and all that stuff. So they were so worried about that that they allowed. You know, when remember when Jesus tied the whip together and he went whipping through the church and he said, "My house will be a house of prayer, but you made it into a den of thieves." Remember when he said that? The reason why is because they had got so used to uh, collecting, worried, being worried about collecting enough money to pay their taxes that they did not address the sin, the, the repentance and sin of the other of people in the congregation. They didn't even care about that anymore. You know, so, so long as they're giving us enough money, we're not going to call them to repent from their homosexuality. We're not going to call them to repent from their fornication and whoremongering. We're not going to call them to repent from, from all that astrology and numerology and all that kind of stuff. All we care about is getting enough money to pay Caesar off. And that's why Jesus Christ always had conflict with them. Because he was calling people, just when John the Baptist called people to repent from sin. And as I pointed out, you know, he didn't get arrested. John the Baptist didn't get arrested because because he was collecting money and telling people you can get out of poverty. He got arrested for telling Herod and 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 his wife that was really Herod's brother's wife, you know full well you ain't supposed to. He was upholding the word of God and and the commandments. You know full well Herod, you ain't supposed to be married to that your brother's wife while your brother's still alive. And that's one of the things that the people were going out who were going out into him and repenting is because they understood in their hearts that uh, that the, the Sanhedrin was just after money and they would make up all that all that uh false man-made teachings they made up. Don't pick up your mat on sun on Sabbath day. Don't do any work. You can't even pick up your mat and go here and there and everywhere. All these little stupid things that the scripture police would come out and arrest you for if they caught you doing that. But the stuff that was really important, turning away from your wicked ways, they didn't care about as long as you gave them the money. You see, that was the big that was the big issue. If you say, what was the big issue? Why why was they so worried about uh John the Baptist preaching? Why was they so worried about Jesus Christ? Preaching, if you want to look at it from a worldly point of view, because they were losing money. Same thing, Acts chapter 16, 16. Why was the the, uh, uh, the apostles treated so badly? It wasn't it wasn't just because they were saying they were telling people that y'all worshiping false gods and goddesses and all that kind of stuff. These people were making money off of these off of the lore. Of these false gods and goddesses. You know these countries. I'm going to tell you right now. These countries like India and China. And all these other places. For a while. for If you're talking, talking about the past. Maybe not so much more China anymore. What were they making money off of? Tourism. And what did the tourists come to see? They wanted to come and visit. Those statues like uh, Vashti. And all that. These temples. That's what most tourists come Go to India. If you're going to tour someplace, you go to these places and they're touring and, be, and, and Greece and Rome even too. They're touring because they want, they're want they interested in learning about these all these uh, idols, gods and goddesses and how to, how to worship them and all that kind of stuff, you know, and, and what what is the culture of, of worship and all that kind of stuff. Morgan Freeman even had, had some... Uh, 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 a series on, I guess, a mini series talking about finding God or searching for God, and he goes off and interviews all these people, and, and and you know he tries to bring up some stuff and that 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 you know historically, and and they always try to tie in something that they was doing way before Jesus came that to prove that Jesus is just just like that demon in Acts sixteen sixteen. They, those those people from all over the world, especially India and the Orient and Tibet and all the places, will always try to bring up something, saying we was following this before we ever even heard about Jesus, and then Jesus Christ uh, or the Christians pulled some of their influences from our ancient religion, which is not true. But they will say that, you know, and they and like if you watch them programs, they, they will say that, 
you know now let's let's look at it from from the real back to the tower of babel okay now if you ever read flavors josephus what happened why did nimrod you know it's not in the bible but i'm just telling you you pray about it if you don't believe me now why did nimrod and the, and the uh, people who came off the ship why did they want to build a tower up up they, or they thought they could build a tower up to God and knock God off his throne in the first place here was why okay according to Flavius Josephus if you ever read the book he said that uh, after Shem, Ham and Jephthah came off the ship and God told them now remultiply go and remultiply the earth the people the, the descendants of Shem, Ham and Jephthah the children of Shem, Ham and Jephthah they were afraid because they were scared that God might flood the earth again. Okay? So God causes a lightning bolt or something to hit the mountain, Mount Sinai, and scatter the people off the mountain so that they can start reply, re, repopulating the earth. So Nimrod, the grandson of, of uh, Ham, or the grandson, the great grandson, the grandson of Ham, he gets up in, into him. The, well, he lets the devil get up into him and said, he says, who does God think he is to make us come off this mountain and, and, and disperse us like this? You know, after we've been, we, we've already been through one flood. Who does God think he is? So Nimrod, and this has nothing to do with color or skin. This is just who Nimrod was. He was, he was descended from Ham. Nimrod decided to get, stir the people up and say, you know what? Let's get together. Who does God think he is? Let's get together and, and build this tower that they call, they didn't call it a tower of Babel yet, uh, but build this tower. We're going to build this cyclonic tower, and we're going to reach up. Now, those of us who, who know today, scientifically today, there ain't no way you're going to build a tower and reach up into the heavens, but, <laughs> you know, that's showing the, the wisdom of man, Right? This is also showing the wisdom of man. So Nimrod decides he's going to build this temp this tower. And he's going to lead everybody up to the tower. And so what did God do? God waited. And God is talking actually to, G to Jesus. Or talking to himself. Talking to Jesus. However you want to say it. And he says. That's why it says we. Let us. And he's talking about the host of heaven and everybody else. Let us. Do something about we. Do you see man. As he is building up this tower, if, if, if he continues in this fashion, the Bible says now there is nothing that men can do. What God is saying, he's not saying that, that men can accomplish, accomplish great good things. He's saying if these people keep working together in this fashion, they're going to destroy themselves. In a sense. There is nothing bad that they can't accomplish if they keep working this way. So therefore, I'm going to I'm going to divide them up and disperse their language, and have them all speak in different languages so they can't understand each other. That that's what, according to that's the Tower of Babel. So then, when people began speaking different languages, they they realized they could not understand each other, and then they were still angry with 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 God Almighty. You know, after they dispersed. That's when Satan got in there and, and began teaching them how to how to create their own gods to follow. Where am I going with this, right? That's when they started teaching them each nation. To, that's when Satan started teaching each nation how to create your own god to follow out of anger. I'm not. That's where idol worship came from. I'm not going to follow the real god because I'm angry with him for 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 what he's done. And so all of our forefathers thought. They could be angry with the Lord. All of our forefathers, from Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. I ain't talking about Adam and Eve and, and before the flood. I'm talking about afterward. So that's where the idol worship came from in the first place. And then, of course, generation after generation. And God, in his mercy, he could have he destroyed all mankind again and started off a new then. But in his mercy, he did not. You know, so each one of those nations began to teach their children, as as time moved forward, they began to teach their children of, as Isaiah puts it, they made those gods and goddesses with their own hand. 
cut down the trees and made clay or whatever and made these gods and goddesses with their own hand and then sat down and bent down to worship it saying you are my God something they made with their own hands like it says in Isaiah you are my God and I'm going to worship you why because I don't want to worship the real God I'm angry with him so I'm going to do everything opposite influenced by the devil I'm going to do everything opposite because why Satan always wants to prove to God that those of us who created in his image could care less about him right so that's where the idol worship came from in the first place anyway and and so did all kinds of other other uh, sinful activities sinful activities came from Adam and Eve and then when all that happened those people remain sinful. And then that's where all your different cultures come from. Religion, creation, and all that kind of stuff. That's where it comes from. And it's spread out through Europe, Asia, Africa, the Americas. Everybody at one point speaking different languages and all that kind of stuff. Worshiping different gods. That's where it came from. Then we get to the day of Pentecost. And on that day, what does God do? Now, he gives tongues of fire to the apostles. And from speaking one language, he opens up the ears of everybody listening. That they hear this message, the good news of Jesus Christ, in their own language. Right? And that's giving it to us that we know. Can't nobody tell us. Because they speak a different language. They don't understand salvation. They don't know who Jesus Christ is and all that kind of stuff. Alright? So now, that's why I said, you know, if you if you read Romans chapter 1. And put yourself in the place of a person. Of that person. This is who we are without Jesus. Right? Just think about it for a minute. And be thankful that we have Jesus. We know who Jesus is. This is also the stuff that we're supposed to be repenting from. So if anybody out there is calling themselves a Christian, but you know you're still involving yourself every day you wake up, uh, you wake up every day, um, you wake up, that's my daughter, <laughs> every day you wake up and, uh, and you say to yourself, after the Lord wakes you up actually, because he could have took you when you were sleeping, right? You wake up and you decide for yourself after you... Get yourself dressed in anything. You, you decide for yourself who or what kind of wicked activity can I go involve myself in. Every day you do that. Every day you do that in God's face. After he wakes you up. Not realizing that he's being merciful with you. Especially if you're declaring yourself to be born again Christian. Or, or that you, you decided to follow Jesus and all that kind of stuff. Well... You know, somebody has to point out to you that um, that's not following Jesus. If you're going back, if just like Jesus said, if you're going back every day or even a minute of the day or whatever, if you're going back to your sins like a dog returning to his vomit or a pig returning to the mud, that's not right. And that's what uh, we call repentance. We need to we need to repent from those things. You see, now now that we laid that foundation. After we repent from those things, that's when we open ourselves up and allow ourselves to be prepared for the Lord to prepare us through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. He begins to wash and cleanse us on the inside. He begins to wash us if we let him wash us. I want to turn to John, John chapter 13. Let me turn to John chapter 13, what I'm talking about here, because I want to, I want to show you. I don't want to just tell you all the time, but show you. you read, read John chapter 13. Pay very close attention, excuse me, very close attention to what Jesus says to Peter about washing. About those of us who are already Christians. Okay? What he says here. Uh, let me see. It was just verse 1. It was just before the festival of, of Pesach. And Yeshua knew 
that the time had come for him to pass from this world to the Father. Having loved, loved his own people in the world, he loved them to the end. They were at supper, and the adversary had already put the desire to betray him in the heart of, of Judah, of, uh, of Judah, of Ben Shimon. Uh, from Kriot, okay, from Kriot. Yeshua was aware that the Father had put everything in His power and that He uh, had come from God and was returning to God. So He rose. That was His purpose for rising up. He rose up from the table, removed His outer garments, and wrapped them, wrapped a towel around His waist. Then He poured some water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the Talmudim and wiped them off with the towel wrapped around him. Remember, I'm reading out of the uh, Jewish, uh, complete Jewish Bible, so it has Hebrew words in there, but read along in your Bible and you see who, who is who and what's what. Uh, verse 6, He came to Shimon Kepha, who said to him, Lord, you are washing my feet? Yeshua answered him, You don't understand yet what I am doing. But in time, you will understand. No, said Kepha. You will never wash my feet. And Yeshua answered him, If I don't wash you, you have no share with me. Lord, Shimon Kepha replied, Not only my feet, but my hands and head too. And Yeshua said to him, A man who has had a bath, you're already saved. You've already been saved. A man who has already had a bath doesn't need to wash except his feet. Alright, you might be saved, but you still got some things to repent from and, and, and let the Lord wash out your life. Some activities. You think about while I'm reading this, Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. That's what he was telling the churches. The three churches. Alright? Help to his feet. His body is already clean. And you people are clean, but not all of you. He knew who was betraying him. This is why he said not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, uh, taken back his clothes and returned to, uh, to the table and said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me rabbi or rabbi and lord and you are right because I am. Alright? Then he says, Now if I, the lord rabbi, have washed your feet, you also should wash each other's feet. For I have set you an example. We're supposed to lead by example, right? Not, not by our words, but our example. I have set you an example so that you may do as I have done. Yes, indeed, I tell you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is an emissary greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So basically, I, what I wanted to point out with that, that there was when Jesus said, if you don't let me wash you, you don't have no part with me. And the fact that he pointed out to them that, yeah, yeah you're already... In my grace, you're already, in a sense, saved like that. You know, of course it's not. They, they had to go through Pentecost and, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But I'm just saying for what he was telling them, you're already, you're already all right with me, but there's still some things that I need to take care of. There's still some things in your life I need to wash out. Right? That's what the, the thing about um, being Christian, we, we grow up or we go to these churches, the church, that's why I say it's true. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, you, are, you shall be saved. It's true that Jesus Christ nailed sin up on the cross. But what is not true is that because He's done all of this and because we are saved by grace and faith, what is not true and what is not being uh, stressed 
at, at a time like this when we don't know how we're going to leave this world, we don't know the next person that's going to, the next natural disaster, the next person that's going to get get a demonic spirit in his or her mind to go shooting up people or anything like that or shooting up in the church or anything like that. Um, you know, uh, what's not true is that we have a green light to keep living in our sin saying, oh, I don't care. I'm not even worried about me doing this because I'm going to go to have Jesus is going to forgive me anyway and blah, blah, blah. You know, if he didn't love me, he wouldn't have gave me all this money to go do what? Indulge more deeply in my sin and this, this that and the other. Those people, those brothers and sisters who, who continue not to repent from that kind of understanding, those are the ones that's going to be, as it says in Matthew chapter 7, them, them, those, those are the brothers that are going to be like, but, but didn't we call demons out in your name? Didn't we do all this stuff in your name, brothers and sisters? And, and, and Jesus is going to turn around to them and say, away from me, you workers of wickedness, I never knew you. That's what he's talking about. And that's so important. That's, that's the foundational thing of, of repentance. When we come into the faith, and then he said, he gave us an example. We're supposed to lead by example, right? Right? So that's where, if, if we come back to Romans chapter 2, that's what Paul is talking about. He's saying the same thing. Before we go out and call other people to repent from their sins, we need to, especially those of us who are leaders, ministers, pastors, if we call ourselves that, and we say that, and we profess ourselves to be be uh, leads and guides to Jesus Christ. We have to make sure that we've repented from our sins. We've confessed and repented from whatever our sins are. We need to be make sure that our personal relationship with Christ is in the right place first. Right? And so I've been preaching about that for a while. But now, like I said, even though I'm trying to do some formality here, uh, I do enjoy going on a asking the Lord to take us on an adventure a spiritual adventure as we read the word and it doesn't matter if, if we've come across that same scripture right a hundred a thousand times in my life I may have come across the same scripture but there's always something that either uh, either the Lord shows to me or something that that we speak upon that is helpful to somebody. I never assume that because somebody is educated like me or, or or we grew up in the same country, we speak the same language that everybody knows everybody knows the same thing. I never put myself in a position where I think I'm smarter than anybody else, but at the same time, and I'm speaking from my own experience, some people, you know, are shocked. I've had people shocked, you know, I'm a professional I do a lot of things. I'm a professional massage therapist. I'm a professional phlebotomist. I'm a professional medical assistant and things like that. Sometimes patients even get shocked because they, or or they treat you with, I don't know, I don't know what to call it, but they treat they get they get surprised when when they tell you something about medicine that you didn't know because like even between that that uh, medical professional, I'm not a doctor, but between that medical professional. And the patient relationship. Sometimes patients aren't stupid either, and sometimes they may have, they may know something that in medicine. Shoot, medicine has so many different departments and so many different things, and and in and each part department has its own research. So somebody may have come up with something that in time past, and I just didn't, I didn't know about. But I've had some patients look at me with shock. You're a medical professional. You're taking care of me, and you didn't know about this. And it's like, well, I apologize, but you know, I'm. <laughs> there's no way I'm not all full of knowledge. There is no way I could know everything. But thank you for telling me, though, because now I know. You know, I know something that I didn't know before. Thank you. But I try to encourage the person. Thank you. And you know, I'm. I'm not the kind of person. That's not my attitude. I'm. I'm, I'm gonna go in and act like I know everything, and you know nothing. You know, I've seen some doctors. I always say I always say up on the floor. I'm 47 years old, right? And I'm a nurse assistant. And see, doctors and interns are coming out of that Vanderbilt College every year. And sometimes, you know, 
the doctors, they are young, and they have a lot of knowledge, you know, and, and I say, but they, of course, they lack, they lack wisdom, and, and, and a lot of times, you know, they're young, so I always say to people, you know, these doctors get younger and younger every year, you know, when, when sometimes the patients get frustrated, because the doctor is, but they don't know it because they're so young. The doctors sometimes treat the patients when they're talking to them like like they're dumb. <laughs> they really do. I mean, it's something that that um, these young people. I mean, they of course they'll learn over time, you know. But but, but it's sometimes your words are like an uh, an arrow. Once you once you release it from the bow. You know, it's flying toward its target. They can't come back. You know, so sometimes they make statements or they do things. And I remember when I was younger, I would make a statement or do something like that, and I didn't realize that that I guess the 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 my accent or the the my mannerisms made the the other person feel like I was I was saying that they was dumb and un, and unintelligent or something like that. You know, and. Um, but of course, as you get older, you get more sensitive to that because now you're the old person, and now here's some young cat speaking to you like like you don't know anything unless I taught you. <laughs> you know, uh, you know. Sometimes we get that from our children, right? You know, it's it's amazing how our children. Now, now I have two two children who are in the adult phase right now, and and it's amazing sometimes how they just you know my oldest son he only been an adult for two years. Right, and there's some things he can tell me about modern technology and all that kind of stuff, but, but you know, there's always those 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 moments when your child tries to tell you something, as if, you know, I'm so I'm I'm your son, I'm more intelligent than you, <laughs> or I'm your daughter, I'm more intelligent than you, you know, that kind of thing. It happens to everybody, right? Every parent goes through it, right? All of a sudden. Uh, what did uh, Shakespeare said something? I think it was William Shakespeare. He said uh, when he was 16 years old that his father was to him his father was the, the the most stupid man in the world. But then after he turned 30, I say after he turned 30 years old, so he was like 15 to 30, his father all of a sudden became the most wisest man in the world. And uh, that was a statement I, I believe William Shakespeare said. I'm not 100% sure if it was William Shakespeare or not. Don't quote me on it. But I think that's where I, I heard it from. And uh, it just goes to show how that everybody goes through that. You know, your children. So I don't, I don't want to try to speak to anybody as if, you know, I try my best not to speak to anybody that I'm preaching to as if I know so much about God and you're so like, like, Bible illiterate or anything like that because I know that's not true. Um, so, but in what I was saying is now that we've laid that foundation, uh, we can go through, I can go through uh, Romans chapter 3 and we can read through the chapter and we can go on an adventure and we can let the Holy Spirit give us something wonderful to think about, wonderful to talk about. Even if the, the Holy Spirit, as I read, if it lets me think about something that I need to repent about, I'll say so. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be humble. I'll say so. I mean, if, if, if there's something that, that cuts me to my heart, I'll say so. And if it's something that we read and, and we discuss here uh, that cuts you to your heart, you know, I encourage you, don't, don't get upset. Just repent about it. Don't get upset. Don't get mad. Be like the Roman soldier in Matthew chapter 8. Let's repent about it, okay? So here we go. We're going to read Romans chapter 3. Then, I'm, I'm starting at verse 1. Then what advantage has the Jew? What is the value of being circumcised? Much in every way. See, that's why I said, that, right off the bat, that's why I said, I'm not trying to tell anybody to, to not be, be uh, proud of your culture or heritage if as long as, as long as it's not the religious stuff, but be, be where you came from. 
you know, that it is important. God has made us what he made us. It has a value. Okay? Just like being Jewish has a value. Right? But here he is, just like what I said here. He's Here he's starting to get into it. Just because you are of a certain race or color of skin, that lion teaching that, that, that you have free pass into heaven because of that? No. That's a lion teaching. That's a lion teaching. And if you hold on to that teaching and don't repent for it, I don't care who you are, you know, as an individual, if we hold on to that, that belief and we teach young kids that, that lion belief, not only are we causing them to sin against God, but we're locking ourselves out of heaven. And that's why it's important to know the truth and study your, study your word for yourself and pray and ask God to give you insight through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, not just from your own intelligence. So we go on. Pastor Paul says here, uh, what should we say that, uh, excuse me, uh, going into verse, still into verse 2. In the first place, the Jews were entrusted with the very words of God. If some of them were unfaithful, so what? Does their faithlessness cancel God's faithfulness? No. Right? Heaven forbid. God would be true even if everyone were a liar. As the Tanakh says, so that you, God, may be proved right in your words and win the verdict when you are put on trial. Now, if our unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, what should we say? Listen up. Listen up. That God is unrighteous to inflict his anger on us? What are they talking about? We, we, we just got talking about sinning, right? That's part of that lying pe preaching. Okay? Part of that lying preaching. They say, well, God, God is not going to... I'm, I'm a Christian. I believe that Jesus died and nailed it up on the cross. He's not going to hold my sins against me so I can keep sinning. That's what Paul is getting into right here. He says, God is unrighteous to inflict his anger on us. That's a question. And he says, here in my Bible, in parentheses, Paul says, I am speaking here the way uh, people commonly do. So he's addressing this right now. Heaven forbid. Else, how could God judge the world? If sin is no longer sin... Like some people are in the habit of saying, they say, I'm Christian, we Christian, and God ain't going to hold it against us. Well, Paul's saying right here, no, that's not true. How could God judge the world for not repenting from sin if sin is no longer sin? They don't have no need to repent. Jesus have no need to forgive you for anything if it's, if it's no longer sin. If that activity is no longer sin, listen up, LGBT. If that activity is no longer sin, listen up all the people who are out right now. You're having sex with somebody and y'all saying boyfriend and girlfriend, but you know you ain't walked down the aisle. You ain't married that person. You're not lawfully wed to each other. You are not presenting your relationship to God in a righteous way. You are presenting your relationship to God in an unauthorized. Remember Aaron's two sons in Leviticus chapter 10. You are presenting every day. You do every minute. You hold your relationship like that. You are presenting it to the Lord in an unauthorized manner. Should you be blessed for that? No. <laughs> why? That's why it's important. Some people will say, I don't see why, why we just can't shack up and, and why we got to go get a marriage license and all that stuff. One commandment, obey the laws of the land. The laws of this land in the United States says... You need to go get a marriage license. Okay? Now, the laws of the church says that you need to walk down the aisle in front of a, 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 a pastor or a priest or whatever you call it, your leader of your church. 
you need to walk down in front of them and, and, and y'all have to have that actual wedding ceremony just like you need to get water baptized you need to go th through your wedding ceremony it, it has to take place amongst witnesses the, who are the witnesses? your family and your spouse's family and everybody else are witnessing that y'all are going to walk down that aisle and declare yourselves to belong to one to become one with one another you got to go through the ceremony if you want to please God that's why if you want to do it right before the eyes of the Lord that's why anybody can go shack up and see the thing about that shacking up is once y'all grow tired of each other then y'all justifiably go off and split on off and, and go, go, go have sex with somebody else but you both of you are sin on top of sin doing that That's what it is. Are a lot of us guilty of it? Yes. But we need to repent about it. And we need to stop telling the next generation it's okay. Because it's not okay. Right? So we're going on with the Bible. Okay, he says here, uh, How can God judge the world? Verse 7. But you say, he's saying to people, he's talking to the Romans. And he's talking to people who are calling themselves Christians. But always keep putting up this argument. Paul is saying, but you say, <laughs> if through my lie, God's truth is enhanced and brings him greater glory, careful, he says, why am I still judged? For merely being a sinner, or in his, why am I still judged for committing sins if my sinning makes makes God all the more glorious? Does that sound wise? Or well, that sound kind of silly, doesn't it? But we know we have brothers and sisters in Christ who speak like this, and that, and that I'm I'm not condemning. I'm calling. We need to repent. We don't have time to be playing around with our salvation like this. And then Paul, Paul says in verse 8, Indeed, why not say, as some people slander us by claiming we say, that we do say, let us do evil, let us keep sinning, so that good may come of it. That's a question. Against them, listen, against them, the judgment is a just one. That's why. Anybody out there saying, I'm unloving, I'm not teaching you, I'm, and why am I bringing this up, this, that, and the other? Because especially if we're Christians, we are holding ourselves out of the kingdom of heaven. We're holding ourselves in that position where God and Jesus is going to have to tell us, get away from us, I never knew you. If we keep on sinning, if we tell ourselves, or we let the, the devil, or we lie to ourselves and say, let's go ahead and do evil, or let's go ahead and keep sinning so that good may come of it. So I can go ahead and keep indulging in my sinful activity. Alright? We got to get this. We got to grow up now. We got to mature. I know we all born again works in progress and we haven't all started from the same spot. But we're supposed to be encouraging one another to do the right thing. The righteous thing instead of the unrighteous thing. And we can't be ignoring it. If you know a brother or sister that's been doing something, especially if they call themselves a Christian, they ain't representing Jesus Christ, you got to take them to the side. You know, Don't make yourself... I'm not saying go be a nuisance at your job or anything like that. You know... Wisdom. There's time and place for everything. If somebody at your job asks you a question and y'all start discussing about Jesus Christ, that's one thing. You know? But you, when you're at your job, you're supposed to be doing your job, right? You ain't supposed to be out there stopping doing your... I'm going to stop doing my job because I have to let all y'all know. You know? It, if it come up in conversation, pray and ask the Lord that it come up in conversation. If you're really concerned about that person's salvation, whether they saved or whether they're a Christian and they think they can keep sinning. You know, pray that it come up in conversation. By the way, 
you know, if you know the person is professing to be a Christian, say, share the Bible with them at lunch break or something. You know, by the way, I've been reading some of this other stuff and, it, and it's saying, and the Spirit is saying something different to me, you know, than it was before about, about my daily activities, or about what we can get involved in. Bring the conversation up that way. You don't have to be, be a, a, a what do you call it, a, a Bible thumper or with fire and brimstone beating people over the head with the Bible and all that kind of stuff or beating people over the head with the truth <laughs> you know they don't have to be that way it'll come up in conversation trust me and if you and if you're um preaching by example people will come up and ask you questions it's a given you got the spirit of Christ in you people will start at the job and everything hey I notice you don't get stressed out like other co-workers do hey I I'm going to be honest with you. The reason what is because I have Jesus in my heart. Something, you know, just, just start the conversation. <laughs> you know, hallelujah, right? All right, but anyway, let's get back to it. Okay, so uh, verse, I mean, verse 9. So are we Jews better off? Are we better off because we are African? Are we better off the Caucasians? Are we better off? Because we this, that, and the other. That's where that other lying philosophy come in. Where they say uh, that because of the color of your skin or the, or your race, uh, you are, you have a free passage in, into heaven. And he, see, Paul is addressing that. He might be talking about Jews, but this is a racial thing. He's talking about race because what if all of us shoot? They got the uh, what is it? The Nazis going to go protest in Murfreesboro on October twenty eighth? Murfreesboro. And uh, and uh, Shelbyville, here in Tennessee. And I want to encourage. I want to encourage people. I know that there's going to be some black folk, that and, and other white folk going out there protesting, anti-protesting against them. You know what? Keep an eye on your enemy, but leave them alone. When they go out there and protest, the best thing you can do is ignore them, but make sure you watch them, but ignore them. They trying they trying to find buttons to push on people. They going out there going to do all that stuff to push buttons. And that's when you're supposed to turn if you if you got any sense, turn the other cheek. But that don't mean let them get away with, with, with doing something disrupt. They got the police out there surrounding them and all that stuff. Just walk on by. You know? Yeah, what is that old song? This is a, a secular song. If you see them Nazis walking down the street and they start to cry and do all that stuff, just walk on by. <laughs> In the name of Jesus Christ, just walk on by. Because <laughs> if they don't repent from that stuff, you know, I'm, only thing if you are, are going to say something, tell them, you know, just because your skin is white don't give you a shoe into heaven. If you haven't been turning away from your sins, I don't care how much flag you wave on the day of judgment, you know, that flag going to be burning in hell with you unless you repent. And stop all that racism and hatred and all that kind of stuff. Usually them Nazis and another, their parents taught them from, from birth that, that because their skin is white, God's showing them favor. That's why they do it. You see, how these little 20 year old and, and uh, uh, people are waving the Nazi flag and doing all this stuff because their parents probably, most likely, Either their parents or somebody, their guardians or something, taught them that they were superior because they were white. And their parents can go out and act like, oh, we, we never knew, we never understood that our child was doing this, that, and the other. If you've been neglecting your, your children, not knowing what they're doing, you know, some people, okay, we, we also got the heroin epidemic, right? And... From what I've seen, I'm not I'm not saying that this is, but from what I've seen on the news, majority of time, uh, the parents who are taking this heroin and letting their children just go run off rampant anywhere and learn any kind of lying education or whatever, any kind of these lying beliefs, their parents are usually on heroin and, and doped up somewhere and neglecting their children. And just like just like a black person. Where they say, uh, 
they get involved in gangs because the parental figures are not there. You know, some of these parents, unfortunately, we had to pray for them. Some of these white parents are doping themselves up on heroin, not knowing who or where their children are. And then their children get caught up in these Nazi, Nazi parties and skinheads and all that kind of stuff. Same thing. Wrong is wrong, no matter what color it is. It's wrong. Same thing. You know, and, and in that sense, I pray for those those young men and, and women who got caught up in that and now are part of a Nazi party and they hate all races and they think they're racist. they superior because they're white. Can't, you know, common sense ought to tell you cancer don't care. I, I work in a hospital. There's just as much people, black, white, Asian, whatever. I see just as many people get cancer, Alzheimer's, dementia. I don't see white folk, black folks, all kinds of colored folks, dementia, Alzheimer's, cancer, diabetes. You know, illnesses don't care what color you are, and they definitely don't care how much money you got. I mean, I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't seen, I don't had millionaires and poor people come through the hospital looking for treatment for their illnesses with cancer or whatever. Let's be real. Your race, your color, your skin don't matter. If it don't matter to cancer, it, it definitely must not matter to God. All right? So anyway, let's go on. So are we Jews better off? Then he says, not entirely. For I have already made the charge that all people, Jews and Gentiles alike, in, no matter what race you are, are controlled by sin. Huh? Hallelujah. Says it right there. I don't know. Maybe y'all never really read Romans chapter 3 this way, but Hallelujah. If somebody's ready to repent right now, Hallelujah. As the Tanakh puts it, in verse 10, as the Tanakh puts it, there is no one righteous, not even one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned away and at the same time become useless. There is no one who shows kindness, not a single one. That's what it said. We need to accept that. I'm included in that no one. If it wasn't for the uh, the blood of Jesus, I'd be, I'm, I'm included in that no one. So are all of you, right? You see, here it goes again. He's saying their throats, but I like to say our. If it wasn't for Jesus inside of me, my throat would, would be an open grave. All right? It's only because of the Holy Spirit that, 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 that worketh in me. That is not. Okay, so I'm going to read it like it is. Their throats are open graves. They use their tongues to deceive. I'm guilty. <laughs> Vipers. Venom is under their lips. And their mouths are full of curses and bitterness. Their feet rush to shed blood. And their ways are ruin and misery. And the way of shalom, which is peace, they do not know. There is no fear. Think about all those people that say, you don't have to fear God. God, Jesus is love. You don't have to fear God. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's what the Holy Bible is saying. We are supposed to have some kind of fear. Be very careful of those people who tell you you don't have anything to fear anymore. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we most certainly do. And, I, and I've said before, I've, I've tried to tell you before, we're not talking about a fear of terrorism like the people are afraid they're going to be terrorized. No, this is like a parental fear. That same kind of fear you used to have when you were a child and your mother and father told you not to do something. And you know you still wanted to go do it. 
And you tried to sneak around and make sure they wasn't watching because you was going to go do it anyway. But you still had that fear that if you got caught, you know you was going to get a whooping. Or you know you was going to get chastised. Something was going to happen if mommy and daddy caught you. Now God always see what you do. You can't hide nothing from him. But there needs to be that fear there. I'm too afraid. To deliberately sin up in God's face. That, that needs to be that fear there. You know, we born again Christians. I can't afford to be sinning. I done, I done did enough already right up in God's face. I've repented from enough already. I would be, personally, I'm not talking about anybody else. I'd be a fool to go and deliberately sin after all the awareness that God has given me about what sin is and what we're supposed to be getting away from. I'd be a fool to want to hold on to that or try to show God like like, like Aaron two sons tried to show him in Leviticus 10 that he made a mistake and that, that it's alright to involve myself in this activity anyway I'm going to show you God everything going to be alright God Almighty I'm, I'm trying to show him you know I'd be fooled because I know I know doing something like that I'd get burnt not physically burnt like Aaron's two sons but I mean, you know, I would get burnt in the second death because I wouldn't survive the second death, which is hell. Right? So, that's that fear of not doing the right thing before my father is, is one of the main reasons why, is the main reason probably why I neither want to um, refuse to repent from, from sins and nor do I want to neglect Letting everybody else know what sin is in God's eyes. I won't be tempted by, at this point in my life, I won't be tempted by great great amounts of money or anything like that. I, I choose to continue preaching the truth out of the Bible. Whether anybody else uh, support me or not. You know my daughter, you know the song, uh, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus? Uh, she's up in, in you know, in... In uh, job corps and the and the uh, the Christians that come up there, they told her the story, and she told me the story yes, uh, yesterday. Well, no, she told me the story on Thursday. Thursday, uh, uh, where that song came from, I didn't know this, but uh, supposedly, I don't even know if it's true, but that's the story they told her, and she passed it on to me. The story is that there was an African tribe somewhere where these missionaries came came to and started teaching them about Jesus Christ. And a few of the people, they weren't leaders or anything. They were just commoners in the tribe. They accepted Christ as, as Lord and Savior. While the, um, the tribal leaders and the people of power in that tribe chose to hold on to their idol worship. And they said that if any of the, the people in their, in their uh, tribe or whatever chose to follow Jesus that they would be put to death tortured and put to death and it was the response of these people that said I have decided to follow Jesus whether I live my life or not I'm not going to turn back from the, my decision and then that that's supposedly where that song came from I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back I just wanted to throw that in there because my I didn't know that. See, like I was saying before, I didn't know that. But all the Bible study and I, I've done over the years, I didn't know that was where that song came from. <laughs> but that's why that song says, Though none go with me, I will follow. You know, no turning back. If you take my life, even though you kill me, still I will follow. That's what the, the people actually said. But they change it to don't no, none go with me, still I will follow. But you know, hey, you know, learn something new every day. Anyway, so he says here uh, in verse 19 Moreover, we know that whatever the Torah says, it says to those living within the framework of the Torah. If you grew up in a, in a church somewhere, I know you heard the word of God every day. As compared to somebody who did not grow up, uh, their parents did not take them to church. That's what he's saying right here. So you grew up in the framework of the Torah. 
in order that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world be shown to deserve God's adverse judgment. Verse 20, For in his sight no one alive will be considered righteous on the ground of legalistic observance of the Torah commands. Because what the Torah really does is show people how sinful they are. Now, this is where it comes from. Doing things, trying to obey God in your own strength. See, we're elevating from the repentance, right? The difference. I, am, I, am I obeying God in my own strength? Or have I been washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ and anointed by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit? Has the blood of Jesus washed away my sinful desires? Remember, we're talking about washing in John chapter 13. And filled me up with his spirit, which is why I'm doing the, I live a righteous life. Or am I just putting on, If did I just read it out of the Bible and try to apply it with, without ever really repenting or anything? Why is that important? That's important in history also. Constantine. 200 years after the after the church was established Constantine became a Christian from a dream but he was the king of Rome many 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 people when he became a Christian he wanted to establish Catholicism and all that kind of stuff many 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 of the of the Roman citizens did not come to the same repentance that Constantine did Constantine was the king. They said to themselves, we don't want to lose our position. They were afraid that if they, they were used to being, if you don't listen, you don't obey the king, the king is going to kill you. They were used to that. So they thought in their head, well, since Constantine wanted to be a Christian, we need to put on the Christian, the Christian garb too. But they didn't really have, a, I am, I'm not saying all of them. But majority of them did not really have a, a change of heart saying, I understand who Jesus is and he died for me. No, they just went along with the program. Well, I don't want the king to come kill me, so therefore, you know, therefore I'm gonna I'm gonna declare myself Christian without going through without really going through or being allowing the, the Holy Spirit to take them through a true change. They just put on change the Roman armor and, and put on the papistry robes or whatever you want to call it. That's why uh, the Roman Catholic Church, you know, that's why so many of them started to say, which, like I said before, you, real Christianity, you're not supposed to force anybody to accept Christ because if you force a person by threatening to kill them to accept Christ, you know they're not really going to accept Christ. They're going to, they're going to say they. To, to, to avoid death, they're going to say, yes, I believe in Jesus. But when they go into their homes, where it really matters, when they go into their homes, they're going to go back to their old sinful nature. But unfortunately, that's a part of history. That's part of history. So the Roman Catholic churches or whatever, they started setting up these rules uh, that throughout the kingdom, that if anybody didn't want to be, it, it, the, the script got flipped. For 200 years they were killing Christians, but then all of a sudden the script got flipped and now it, you were, you were uh, disobeying the king of Rome if you, were, if you did not want to be a Christian. So then now they started killing people who was not Christians. There's a movie about that, that time and era, era of time or whatever like that I, I watched a while back. Uh, when that time was coming, when they started, uh, the, 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 the Christians rose up or the supposed Christians rose up they started kicking Jews out of out of out of Rome and uh, uh, all the other religions that were persecuting them all of a sudden they were like paying them back and they started persecuting the other religions you know and and killing them off other people off so that was a time when that happened um and that's where we get he Paul is getting to right here. Even though this is the book of Romans, he was writing to 
that was 200 years afterward. He was writing to the Romans of his day, right? And he was saying, saying here, let's let's go back. Okay, it's how sinful they are. That for in his sight uh, alive, no one be, be considered righteous on the ground of legalistic observance. Okay, so if I just read the Bible and I see that it's saying, uh, I'm supposed to turn away from this, this, that, and the other, and I and I do it, and I start calling other people to do it, knowing that I haven't really returned turned away from my sins, and I do that out in public, in the private places. I haven't been, my soul hasn't really been cleansed. You know, sooner or later, I'm going to start going back to my my old sinful ways, and because I've told everybody else out in the street that I'm a Christian now. Well, whenever I'm out in the street, I'm going to be uh, Joe Christian. But the moment I get behind closed doors, my true colors are going to come out, right? My true my true nature is going to come out. And as long as the people don't see me, not thinking about God, not even really believing that God is real, as long as the people don't see me, I'm going to go back to my old sinful ways. It's not real. It's not a real change. Okay, so, so he says here in 20, verse 24, I mean 21, excuse me, 21. But now, quite apart from, from Torah, God's way of making people righteous in his sight has been made clear. Who are we coming up to talk about? Jesus, right? Okay. Although the Torah and the prophets uh, give their witness to it as well and it is a righteous a righteousness that comes from God through the faithfulness of Yeshua the Messiah or of Jesus Christ to all who continue trusting or keeping your faith for it makes no difference whether one is a Jew or a Gentile in God's eyes your race does not matter in Christ's eyes, your race does not matter. Since all have sinned and come short from earning God's praise, by God's grace, your race don't matter. It's by God's grace, right? Without earning it, all are granted the status of being considered righteous before Him. Through the act of redeeming us from our enslavement enslavement to sinful lifestyle to sin that was accomplished by the Messiah Yeshua or by Jesus Christ God put Yeshua forward as the kapora for sin through his faithfulness in respect to his bloody sacrificial death. This vindicated God's righteousness because in his forbearance he had passed over with neither punishment nor remission the sins people had committed in the past. Not presently in your past. <laughs> and it vindicates his righteousness in the present age showing by showing that he is righteous himself and is also the one who makes people righteous on the ground of Yeshua's faithfulness of Christ's faithfulness so what room is left for boasting not at all what kind of Torah and what, what kind of boasting you you think he's talking about? I, I tell them the uh, those uh, black Israelites or black people in general, white folk in general. They they go out there and they say, "Because my skin is black, because my skin is white, God is showing me favor. God is showing you favor. You guys chosen and and the and you know all down the line, white man is the devil and all this other kind of stuff, or the black man is." Is, is not human and whatever all that stuff out there that's boasting boasting about something that ain't true you're boasting about your race as if your color of your skin gonna get you into heaven that ain't true none at all Paul says 
What kind of Torah excludes it? We're still in verse 27. One that has to do with legalistic observance of rules? No. Rather, a Torah that has to do with trusting or with faith. It says in the King James Bible, right? Therefore, we hold the view that a person comes to be considered righteous by God on the ground of trusting, which has nothing to do with legalistic observance of, of the Torah commands. Or is God the, the God of the Jews only? Is God God the black of the black people only? Or the white people only? Isn't he also the God of the opposite races? Of all human races, right? Of the Gentiles? Yes. He is indeed God of the Gentiles. Because as you will admit, God is one. There's only one God. Polygamy is a sin. I mean, what is it? Polytheism. Excuse me. Polygamy is a sin and polytheism is a sin. Therefore, he will consider righteous the circumcised on the ground of trusting and the uncircumcised through that same trusting. Does it follow that we abolish the Torah by this trusting? Heaven forbid. On the contrary, we confirm the Torah. Right? All right. So that for right there, that that chapter 3 pretty much goes into it. And he's also talking about circumcision of the flesh around the, around the skin and all that kind of stuff because people uh, were, were coming out saying, well, you can't... Uh, repentance is important, but when they start making up stuff like, oh, you can't really be saved unless you go get circumcised and you're an adult and all that kind of stuff, those are the things, the sacrifices... Uh, because Jesus is one and all sacrifice, no longer needed to do animal sacrifices. And the Apostle Paul was not telling Jewish people that they can no longer sacrifice their baby on the eighth day of his birth. I mean, they can no longer circumcise, excuse me, on the eighth day of his birth. He was saying that if a person is a Gentile and they're an adult male, um, they don't have to go through the circumcision because the circumcision is supposed to be around the heart anyway. They don't have to go through that because Jesus, uh, being the once and for all sacrifice for sins, they didn't have to do those things anymore. But some people, lying and deceiving, will try to tell you you don't have to repent from from other sins anymore. Sin is still sin. Sacrifices may have changed. But sin is still the same sin that got the same things that God calls sin in the Old Testament, still the same thing that God calls sin in the New Testament. That way you got to be careful. Sin is still sin. And it ain't right to keep doing it in front of God's eyes. Keep participating in it and actively going out there pursuing somebody to devour in your wickedness. That's that's not right in God's eyes. So I, I'm going to go into uh, four for a minute, and then then uh, I'll just read like a little bit of four. Um, then what I want to do is uh, we'll go to the our uh, Psalm 51. After I read this, we're going to go into Psalm 51, and we're going to say that repentance psalm. I'm going to call it the repentance psalm because that's when David repented from what he did with Bathsheba. You know. Uh, and then from there, I'll, I'll read a couple of names off, a few names uh, off. And I um, guess we pray out, pray out from there. And I'll let y'all go because I don't, I don't, I'm trying, I'm trying to cut down. Before it was like three hours. I was using up all my three hours. So it's only been uh, an hour and 34 minutes now. So I'm going to try to cut it down short and pray for me. I'm going to make it shorter and shorter, but I don't want it too short. But I want it short enough so that, that you don't have to sit here and listen to me for all this time. But but the, what, whatever the Holy Spirit needs to get through. See, God is working with me. I'm shortening it up. Hallelujah. <laughs> Be patient with me. God is not through with me yet, right? So anyway, let's go to uh, 
chapter 4, a little bit into it. Then what should we say of Abraham's... Oh, excuse me. What Then what should we say? Abraham, our father, obtained his own... Obtained by his own efforts? That's a question. For if Abraham came to be considered righteous by God because of legalistic observances, then he has something to boast about. But this is not how it is before God. For what God does, oh, for what does the Tanakh say? Abraham or Avraham put his trust in God and it was credited to his account as righteousness. Now the account of someone who is working is credited not on the ground of grace, but on the ground of what it is owed uh, to him. Right? However, in the case of one who is not working, but rather is trusting in him who makes ungodly people righteous, his trust is credited to him as righteousness. In the same way, the blessing which David pronounces is on those whom God credits with righteousness apart from legalistic observances. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered over. Blessed is the man whose sin Adonai will not reckon against his account. Remember, he was writing to um, the Jews back then. He says, Now is this blessing for the circumcised only? Or is it or is it also for the uncircumcised? For we say that Abraham, Abraham's trust was credited to his account as righteousness. But what state was he in when it was so credited? Circumcision or uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. In fact, he received circumcision as a sign, as a seal of the righteousness he had been credited with on the ground of trust he had while he still was uncircumcised. Right? This happened so that he could be the father of every uncircumcised person who trusts in Jesus. Right? Uh, and thus has righteousness. Wait a minute. Let me see. Excuse me. This happened. I, I messed up. Okay. Well, this place has. Every person who... Oh, okay, I was in the right place. Every person, uh, uncircumcised person who trusts and thus has righteousness credit to, to him and at the same time be the father of every circumcised person who not only has had a Brit Milah but also follows the footsteps of the trust which Abraham Avinu had when he was still uncircumcised. Right? For the promise to Abraham and his seed is that he would inherit the world did not come through legalism but through the righteousness that trust produces or that faith produces. For if the heirs are produced by legalism or because of his bloodline because they bloodly related to Abraham as the Muslims like to say or the people of Islam if it was because of that right then trust is pointless having faith in God is pointless Having faith that he's forgiven me of my sins is pointless. Because I wasn't born the right color or something like that. If that was true, 
or because I don't have Abraham's blood in me or something like that, then I'm, there's no hope for me. Like, that's what people like to say, but that's not true. All right? All right, legalism, trust, then trust it, or faith is pointless, and the promise, the promise is worthless. There is no promise for me of salvation if it had to do with bloodline or what race I am or whatever, and blood related to Abraham. It says, for what the law brings is punishment, but where there is no law, there is no violation. And he's saying that in one way too. There is no violation. If sin is not sin, you know, you can look at, that's what I just said earlier. If sin is not sin, then uh, then Jesus is not forgiving us. What's, what's the point of him forgiving us for something if, 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 if activity out there is not sinful? Now, I know that's not what he, he's saying, but that's what, that's what came to my spirit. That's why I'm talking about that. You know, whatever the God gives you from, from the word, take it. Glorify him for it. Right? Okay, so where was I? There And no, no violation. Verse 16. The reason the promise is based on trusting is so that it may come from God's free gift. A promise that can be relied on by all the seed. Not only those who live within the framework of the Torah. Not only the people who grew up in church. <laughs> Let me stop. But also those with kind with the kind of trust Abraham had, Abraham Avenue, for all of us. This accords with the Tanakh where it says, I have appointed you to be a father to many nations. Abraham is our father in God's sight because he trusted God as the one who gives life. To the dead and calls non existent things into existence. You don't and I don't call speak things to an existence. That's another one of them preachers. Y'all need to be careful about that. Speak this into existence. 99.9% .9 of the time, or I'm say 95% of the time, when I hear people talk about speaking to existence, it always has to do with something about money or material wealth. Or that 5% of the time somebody is sick and, and the preacher says speak healing into existence. Now I agree with the healing, speak healing into existence, but, you know, asking Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ that I be healed. But I gotta say be careful with that because 95% of the time that I've heard in my life, my experience has been somebody talking about money. And usually, that somebody is still indulging in their sinful nature. And they want the money, not just to get out of poverty, but they want more money so that they can further indulge themselves in what we read in Romans chapter 1, and chapter one as sinful behavior. You got to be careful about that. Even though we were saved by grace and all that kind of stuff, sin is still sin. And if we've been saved then that means the Holy Spirit is washing out any desire that we might have. That's why that gospel song says, I'm not that way anymore. God, through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, not through legalism, not just because I saw something in the Bible and I tried to obey it, but God has came and made a change in my life or in my spirit. Where I have no more desire to do that sinful thing, wicked thing anymore. Alright? That's why that's, that's what that song says to me. Hallelujah. I hope it says that's what it's saying to you. So this is what Paul talked about here. Being saved by grace. I know I ain't. That's why I said earlier. I ain't smarter than nobody or nothing like that. But I know who saved me. And I know how he saved me. And I know it wasn't because of my legalistic efforts. I tried that, okay? When I was younger, I read the Bible and I tried that too. And I didn't understand salvation, what salvation means. Yeah, I even read 
read Romans, still didn't understand what it means, is you know, but I had to go through it and then I had a relapse and then I had to try to figure out how it you know, I had asked God, how is it that I know that this is wrong, but why did I wind up committing these sins anyway? I was trying to follow what I saw in the book. But I didn't understand that I needed to let him wash it out of me because just like Jesus said, if you don't let me wash you, you don't, you don't really have no part with me. This book becomes a philosophy book because you haven't really sat down and, and, and asked me to really come into your life. You haven't really sat down and did that. You read something in the book and based on your human intelligence or your human wisdom, you tried to follow it. And you only followed it for so long before your your sinful desires started to froth up again because they haven't been washed out of you because you haven't asked me to wash them out of you <laughs> you haven't prayed and asked me with a humble heart that I would wash them out of you so they're starting to froth up again if anybody can accept that what I just said and understand that if that helps you you might be wondering how come I've been following God all this time but I still want to go back and do this that and the other got to give it up you got to let him come in he ain't going to force his way, his way in your heart you got to let him come in and wash it trust me I know I was being reluctant to let it go I wasn't sure this had something to do with like I said before uh, family upbringing Jesus told told uh, the Pharisees you, you, you know you honor God with your lips but your heart's far from me you honor the traditions of men rather than the following the real word of God because over the years people growing up in, in the, all these different churches just think about the Mormons they're growing up in those churches and they in, in that order from childhood they're born into the world told that they're supposed to have polygamy wives and all that kind of stuff growing up in that environment if, if they grew up in a Muslim country if they grew up in a Buddhist country you know, from day one, their parents been telling them all this stuff. And it's not easy when the Holy Spirit comes to you and tells you that this stuff is not true. The average person is not going to just jump up and say, okay, it's not like the Roman soldier. Okay, it's not true. I, I believe everything you say. There's going to be some resistance there. There's going to be some reluctance there. You know, and that's what we need to pray about. That's why I'm not condemning anybody. That's what we need to pray about. You know, um, so he says here, through trusting, uh, to tonight, tonight put it, it says, I have appointed you. Okay. The reason, the promise. Okay, seven, verse 17. I'm going to go there. This accords with the Tanakh where it says, I have appointed you to be a father of many nations. Abraham is our father in God's sight because he trusted God as one who gives life to the dead and calls non-existent thing into existence. For he was past hope, yet in hope he trusted that he would indeed become a father to many nations. In keeping with what he had been told, so many will be your seed be, his trust did not waver when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. Okay, so, um, all right, so, or, or when he considered that Sarah's womb was dead too, he did not. Uh, by lack of trust decide against God's promises on the contrary by trust he was given the power as he gave glory to God for he was fully convinced that what God had promised he could also accomplish God not going to promise you something if he ain't if he can't do it and we know he can do anything right this is why it was credited to his account as righteousness. But the words it was credited to his account were not written for him only. They were written for also for us who will certainly have our account credited too. 
because we have trusted in him who raised Yeshua, our Lord, from the dead. Yeshua, who was delivered over to death because of our offenses and raised to life in order to make us righteous. So I'm going to stop there. We're going to read uh, Psalm 51. And I'm going to say, uh, before we read Psalm 51, my verse 1 starts, uh, if you read in King James Version, your verse 1 starts in my verse 3. So just bear along with me. Read it in your Bible. Psalm 51 is the, is the uh, we call it, I'm calling it the repenters, the repenters psalm. Because if you, if any after what we've discussed today, if anybody out there listening for the first time or whatever, you feel that you've still been living in sin, whether you're a Christian or not right now, or uh, whether you consider yourself a Christian or whether you're looking to be saved, uh, we're going to read uh, Psalm 51 together. But then I'm going to ask you in your quiet time, encourage you. In your quiet time, between when it's just you and Jesus Christ, hopefully you you know Jesus Christ exists. And if you don't know, hopefully you you are allowing yourself to believe he he exists in the first place. Because you know your prayers won't be answered if you don't think he he's there. You will be talking in the air if you don't if you don't really believe he's there. But. Um, I want to read the the uh, repentance prayer together. I mean, the repentance psalm, a pre- repentance prayer together, Psalm uh, fifty. But think about your sinful nature when we read. You know, okay, think about you're saying this to God, and then when you when you get in your quiet place, say a prayer and ask the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, to forgive you for whatever you've been doing wrong, and and to by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Wash and cleanse you in his in his blood and, and fill you up with righteous righteous understanding and wisdom. If you need to get out to a church, remember I'm a ministry, I'm not a church, but you should belong to a church or you should you should know of a church. And don't concern yourself whether the church you go to, the Christian church you go to at this moment is preaching the same things or all that kind of stuff. Don't let anything prohibit you from being a part of a a church body, okay? Um, if you're not already a part of a church body. And if you are, uh, if you are a part of a church body and your ministry or your, your pastors and your leaders in your church seem to never never want to talk about these things, uh, like in Romans chapter 1, they never want to bring the subject up or they never seem to want to just answer you directly if it's wrong or right before the eyes of the Lord and all that. Don't go confront them and make and, and, and make you know factions or anything like that in the church. Just pray about it. We're all human, okay? You know, just like uh, Mary and Joseph. You look at Roman. I mean, Luke chapter two. Mary and Joseph, twelve years after after Jesus, they was with Jesus. They strayed off and, and found themselves three days. Well, I mean. A day's journey away, but three days distance. Let's say that from where Jesus was. You know? It can happen to anybody. If it happened to Mary and Joseph, it can happen to anybody. Your pastor, your leaders, anybody. So just pray for one another and, and, and encourage one another to repent. Anyway, let's go. Uh, for the leader, a psalm of David... When Nathan the prophet came to him after his affair with Bathsheba. God, in your grace, have mercy on me. In your great compassion, blot out my crimes. Wash me completely from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my crimes. My sin confronts me all the time. Against you, you only... Have I sinned and done what is evil from your perspective so that you are right in accusing me and justified in passing sentence? True, I was born guilty, was a sinner from the moment my mother conceived me. Still, you want truth 
in the inner person. So make me know wisdom in my inmost heart. Sprinkle me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear the sound of joy and gladness so that the bones you crush can rejoice. Turn away your face from my sins and blot out all my crimes. Create in me a clean heart, God. Renew in me a resolute spirit. Don't thrust me away from your presence. Don't take your Rach HaKodesh away from me. Restore my joy in your salvation and let a willing spirit uphold me. Then I will teach the wicked your ways and sinners will return to you. Rescue me from the guilt of shedding blood, God, God of my salvation. Then my tongue will sing about your righteousness. Adonai, open my lips. Then my mouth will praise you. For you do not want sacrifices, or I would give them. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice to you, God, is a broken spirit. God, you won't spurn a broken, chastened heart. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteousness. Oh, excuse me, in righteous sacrifices. In burnt offerings and whole uh, burnt offerings. Then they will offer bulls on your altar. And so I want to thank all of you. Uh, let me uh, say a prayer and then I'm going to read some names. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving us this op- one more opportunity to, to go through your word with an adventurous and... Uh, and uh, uh, a uh, seeking heart, an adventurous and seeking heart to be more of the people you called us to be and to have a stronger, better personal relationship with you, Lord Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for everything you've done for me and through me. And thank you for all the people who have come to uh, to listen to all around the, the country and, and perhaps all around the world who have come and have been touched uh, by the message given through this podcasting or this video. I pray that each and every one of those people, if not already uh, saved, would seek salvation. And if already saved, would seek repentance and and strengthening and, and maturation, maturing of their relationship with you and strengthening of their relationship with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for everything. Amen. Okay, so now I get to the name, reading of the names. Okay, let me erase that. Um, I think I was in, I read the E's and the F's. I'm going to read the G's and the H's. Okay, so I'm, I hope I'm saying this right. Gaines Lenore Jr. Uh, thank you. Uh, you live in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hallelujah. See, I'm in Tennessee. There's people listening to me or, or liking my post from way over in Carolina. Um, thank you for liking a post. The next person, Gina Lynn Beasley. And she lives in Wartburg, W-A-R-T-B-E-R-G, Wartburg, Tennessee. Thank you, Gina Lynn. The next person, Glenda Robinson. Thank you. Uh, she lives in Union City, Tennessee. Thank you, Glenda Robinson. Gustavo Maya. Thank you uh, for listening. You, he lives in Miami, Florida. I hope everything turned out all right for you down there, Gustavo. I've been praying for you. Um uh, and uh, hope you you guys are 
are um, on the road or still on the road. I know I heard something on the news. Y'all still on the road to recovery. But I, I'm praying that all of y'all uh, recover swiftly in Puerto Rico and uh, Houston and, well, shoot, California, people in Las Vegas, the people in the church up there right here in Tennessee, wherever wherever something bad doesn't happen, you know, may, let it be for the good of God. The next person is uh, Heather Rickman Lee, or Lee, and she lives in Adamsville, Tennessee. Thank you, thank you, Heather. The next person is uh, Hershey Chumway Spade. It's a female. Hershey Chumway Spade. I hope I said your name right. She lives in Baltimore, Maryland. Thank you, Miss uh, Spade. Thank you. Um, the next person, Hoover Smith. And he lives in Bluntville, Tennessee. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So that that ends the H. The names of the H. And, I, and like I said, I haven't put, forgive me, I haven't had a chance to put the, the other people from that other post. I haven't put you yet, but I will. Forgive me. I, it's only me. I don't have a staff or anything doing all this for me. So between work and uh, the opportunity to get to, to do a podcast and things like that, that the Lord gives me, I'm, I'm trying to do my best. You know, I have, have a lot to do. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to say thank you, Lord, again. I have two children now that 18, 18 and older. So now both of them are pretty much responsible for their own, their own care or their own keeping of their own records and stuff like that. Of course, we're still helping them out. But um, at the responsibility, they, they're responsible to take care of themselves now. You know, they're adults. Now, they have to be the ones responsible for waking themselves up on time and all that kind of stuff. You know, I don't have to keep it egging. That's two. I only got one that I have to do that with now. <laughs> and that's a blessing. You know, I, I thank the Lord for my children and everything, but I also thank Him too. You know, I can concentrate some more, more on some things now myself. You know, those of you with children, y'all understand what I'm saying. You know, I'm not saying anything bad. I'm just saying I love my kids, but... <laughs> You know, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. Okay, so um, on that note, um, I'm going to say, okay, uh, thank all of you for listening. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Aubrey. Uh, and whoever else was out there listening, thank you. Uh, and until next time, uh, God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>